So I'm speaking here, not here. Yeah? Just to know the setup. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, Professor Bovis. And thank you to the um, Institute for Competition and Procurement Studies for inviting me. I think this is a very exciting event and I'm uh, looking forward to hearing all the other presentations these today and tomorrow. Um, I think with these new directives, um, I'm going to focus on the public sector directive. Uh, Turtis already covered um, some of the changes which are also uh, going through in the public sector directive. Uh, I'm going to focus on three topics. I think it's too much to cover everything. So I've, um, I've chosen three topics which are within my research uh, interest areas, public tenders, in-house and abnormally low tenders. And uh, changes are um, massive in these places. First of all, I'll start with public tenders. I'm going to do a bit of history on this because it's like the recital mentioning public tenders is a bit hidden. Um, <coughs> it, currently, we've got this recital um, obliging member states to ensure the public tenders do not distort competition in relation to private tenders. Um, it was actually initiated by the Parliament as a response to the Arga judgment in 2000. And that judgment involved a uh, public tender receiving state aid, submitting very low tenders in competition with private tenders. So this was a response to that judgment. Um, it's only featuring in the public sector directive. It's not in the utilities uh, directive at all. And it's only been used in one particular judgment, namely the Conisma judgment from 2009. And in that judgment, the Court of Justice basically said the tool that you've got to ensure that public tenders are not distorting competition uh, in relation to private tenders is the provision on abnormally low tenders. And in particular, the part saying that you can, um, you can reject tenders tainted by unlawful state aid. So this is sort of the background uh, on this recital. In the 2011 proposal, it was still there. Uh, it moved to recital 14, but otherwise it was, it was in place. But now in these new directives, it's disappeared. Um, so, is this a simplification? And you might say, yeah, well, it was an odd thing to have in the first place because it didn't have a uh, reference to an article in the directive, not, not a particular article dealing with public tenders. So maybe it was just a strange thing to have. Um, and it could also be, say that, be said that primary law um, provides for the same obligation. Public tenders are subject to competition law, state aid law, and the principle of loyalty requires member states to make sure that these rules are not breached. So maybe it's just excessive. Um, and then I've said, well, maybe it was excessive because it hadn't really got any practical relevance. Maybe public tenders don't tender so much. There, there are not many of them. And when they appear, they are model tenderers, so there are no worries about them. Um, I don't know about this. Maybe some of you can confirm experiences with, with the public tenderers and whether they behave well or not. Um, and then my last thought on this is maybe it's just a matter of fashion. Um, in 2000, when they started negotiating the new directives, uh, ARGA had just been laid down, uh, public tenderers, state aid, distortion of competition, there are hot topics. But now maybe something else has come up. Maybe public-public corporation is the new black. So it's just sort of slided out. I don't know. These, I haven't really decided what I think of the disappearance of Recital 4, but I'm just a bit worried. We'll, we'll see what will happen. Maybe you have some thoughts on it. So the next, next thing I'm going to address is uh, in-house and where to start because um, this is a whole new provision. I'm not going to cover it totally because there's so many things to discuss. Um, I think it must have been really difficult for the Commission and the Member States to, to decide to implement this because case law is still evolving and many topics the court hasn't spoken on yet, hasn't had the chance to, to evolve on. Um, but that didn't stop the Commission uh, from introducing it in the proposal in 2011. I've, um, as I said, it would be impossible to cover all of the discussions, uh, so I've chosen three different things that I'd like to, to address, but I'd be happy to discuss other aspects of uh, the provision later. Um, the first thing that I'm going to address is actually the title of the provision. 
So it's saying Article 12, and then it's got this title, and then the, the material provision comes. And uh, the title is Public Contracts Between Entities Within the Public Sector. Is this codification? And maybe it's a bit excessive, stretching it a bit, to talk about codification of a title of a new provision, whether that's codifying case law. But really, in case law, we know that when we've got in-house situations, there's no public contract. So why did they choose this name for the provision? Well, you could say it's perhaps not, it's perhaps not a complication because the provision is wider than in-house. We've also got other public-public arrangement. But I just think that it's a bit odd to choose that title. Um, it could, um, as I've said, potentially backfire. Um, because by calling it public contracts, the potential risk that the Court of Justice will uh, make it, the principles apply in certain circumstances, um, especially since the wording of the provision stipulates that these public-public contracts or arrangements are outside the scope of the directive. And we know from experience with public concessions, public service concessions, that when you're outside the scope of the directive, it means that the principles apply. So I think that the whole wording about this is, is uh, a bit um, brave or a bit dangerous. I don't know which to call it. Um, yes. Then we have the extension of in-house to uh, the mother, the controlling entity, and to sisters, which are also controlled by the mother. So that's, that's a, a new extension. Um, this is not a codification of case law. We haven't, we haven't seen it in case law. Is it a complication? Well, I'd say certainly it's a problem that the market shrinks. Um, and it shrinks by the contracts which the in-house entity will award to its mother or its sisters. And this could, this could be to the detriment of local SMEs. Um, this provision or this codification, it greatly expands the scope of in-house awards. And in time, perhaps some conditions will have to be made by the Court of Justice, just so all public purchasing does not suddenly amount to in-house purchasing. Um, but principally, as I've said, I think it's an understandable extension, uh, because it's just what any undertaking in the market would do, buy from internal departments rather than from the market. So in that sense, I understand it. I just think it should have limits, and I'm sure that the Court of Justice will, will help us in this uh, come time. Um, because it's certainly not clearly provided in Article 12. And then the third thing that I'm going to address, it's actually my favourite, because um, this is private capital involvement. Um, according to Article 12 on in-house, uh, the strict main rule from court's case law that private capital involvement will result in the situation not amounting to in-house is upheld. But then there's an exemption introduced. Um, and that's uh, allowance for non-controlling and non-blocking private capital involvement, which is required by national law. And first thing that comes to my mind is this fits some particular <coughs> national system. Uh, I don't know which, maybe you know. Uh, it's not the Danish, anyway. Um, and it might make sense in some particular national circumstances. I don't know. But it's certainly not... Uh, a codification of case law. Um, question is then, will it give any complications? Oh yes, I think it will. Um, rhetorically, you might ask, why would any private undertaking invest in a public entity? Well, to my mind, there's only one answer. If you, if you, if you shy away from altruism, which is a rare motive by private undertakings, and that's to gain an economic advantage. So, well, again, it's possible that particular national situations will explain why we've put this into the directive. But just to my mind, I've got some economic background as well. This is strange. Um, my worries are in particular that member states will come up with legal constructions suiting this. Um, not for the purpose of, um, of uh, efficiency in the public sector, but for the purpose of avoiding public procurement rules 
and for the purpose of giving an economic advantage to national undertakings. So I think this is a, a real problem. And one might wonder why there's no requirement that the public, uh, sorry, that the private investors should be chosen by public tender. Maybe it's implicit, I don't know, but the Acaset um, case law should be mentioned somewhere here. Um, I foresee that the Court of Justice will eventually require that private capital investors are chosen by public tender, possibly by reference to the principles. So um, I think this is a very important change that could uh, lead strange places that we don't know yet. But um, yeah. My last topic uh, is abnormal low uh, tenders. And this is a favorite of mine. I wrote my thesis on it, so it's a bit of a baby. Um, there are some changes in the provision. You know, uh, sort of the general provision, and uh, in paragraph two, there's a list of reasons that you could inquire about whether this could be the reasons for uh, apparently abnormal low tenders to occur. And that list has been, um, there's been added two reasons. Uh, the first reason is, reason is that you should ask whether uh, the low price is due to lack of compliance with obligations referred to in Article 18, new Article 18, and I've copy-pasted it here. Um, it says that economic operators should comply with environmental, social and labour law um, as set out in EU law, national law or collective agreements or international law. Uh, I'm sure we're going to hear more about Article 18 in, in the session on social agendas, so I'm not going to go further into it. Um, but and sorry, and then secondly, um, the other the other new uh, piece in the list is that you'd have to inquire whether subcontractors live up to these obligations as well. Otherwise, so far, status quo is upheld. Um, and then comes paragraph three, which starts the normal way by requiring the contracting authority to take into consideration the information supplied in the verification process by the tenderer. Um, in order to assess whether the tender is actually abnormally low or not. But then paragraph three proceeds by adding that contracting authorities shall reject the tender where they have established that the tender is abnormally low because it does not comply with the obligations referred to in Article 18. When there is an obligation to reject tenders, does this entail an obligation to identify tenders which appear abnormally low? Well, at least implicitly, because now unsuccessful tenders will have a legal basis to contest almost any procedure where the contracting authority did not verify that Article 18 requirements uh, are fulfilled by the tenders. That's winning the contract. Um, so what are the possible scenarios for the working of this requirement? and the threat of complaints, what are we going to do? I could think of two, but perhaps you can see other scenarios. The first scenario is what I might call circumvention of verification. Um, that could be by requiring tenders in the tender terms and conditions or in the contract terms to verify that they live up to these conditions. Um, neither of these situations solve the real problem, which is exposed adherence to Article 18 requirements. So it would be sort of a formalized way to do it. The second scenario uh, that I see, which is more unfortunate, I think, actually, is the contracting authorities that will only verify tenders submitted by foreign tenders or by tenders including foreign subcontractors. Um, yeah. I'll leave it at that. Well then, is this a simplification, codification, consternation or complication? Well, it's certainly not a simplification. I think I've made that clear. Um, and in my interpretation, it's not a codification either. I know that the Slovensko judgment has been interpreted by some to uh, impose an obligation to verify abnormal low tenders. But this is not news. If the tender is identified as apparently abnormally low, you consider to reject it, you'll have to verify it properly. And this was the case in Slovensko. They were identified as apparently abnormally low, they were being rejected, so that's just the same as it's always been. 
this was the context of the case and that's the way it should be read. So I don't think that this new obligation to reject tenders on specific grounds and thereby to identify tenders on specific grounds uh, as apparently abnormal law is a result of the Svensko judgment. I don't see it. And therefore I don't see it as a codification. Then consternation. I had to look the word up, to be honest. Um, and in the dictionary it said, it's a state of paralyzing dismay. A sudden alarming amazement or dread that results in utter confusion. <laughs> and actually I think this is a very suitable description of the feeling that many contracting authorities will have when they discover what this, um, what this obligation to reject actually implies. Um, then lastly, will it, uh, will it entail complications? I think that checking for compliance with uh, environmental law, social law, labor law is routine for many contracting authorities. But mandatory verification of every successful tender is not. Uh, so it will entail some complications. Um, so it's my conviction that this change will complicate the lives of contracting authorities, especially because Article 18 also mentions collective agreements. I'm not going to go into that, but in particular, some member states have problems uh, with these collective agreements. Um, yeah. So these were the things that I decided to comment on.